Good day, everyone, and uh, praise the Lord, wherever you are. Uh, we thank the Lord for creating another chance for us to be here and be able to share in his word. And uh, I'd like to welcome everyone, and I'd like to pray as we end into uh, this presentation, and uh, may the Lord continue guiding us as uh, we learn together. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we pray that uh, you may hold the winds, that they may not blow until your people are sealed, that these things that we are learning, Lord, we may put in practice, and at the end of the day, after all has been said and done, let us ask ourselves, how have we walked in the life that we have received? And so give us the strength to endure until the end. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, welcome, brothers and sisters. And uh, I once again welcome us to this uh, nightly presentation on the tabernacles, the sanctuary. And we are going through the sanctuary and uh, seeing what the Lord is speaking to us. And I pray that uh, you be blessed, that uh, I too be blessed, that all we may make it to heaven, not uh, for the fear of being lost, not for the joy of being saved, but for the purpose of love, the agape love that cannot fade away. And so welcome once again, and uh, may the Lord be with us as we go through this session. Uh, we are in part four of uh, our presentation. We are in part four of um, our presentation and uh, we are dealing with uh, the veil and its efficacy. Yesterday, the, the previous presentation, I mean, we looked at the veil um, uh, as it is revealed and uh, a new living way. That is what we were studying yesterday, uh, the veil a new living way, but today we go into another uh, uh, step further and look at the veil and it is efficacy. And so uh, there is so much to speak about Jesus Christ. I wonder how we find time to speak about other things and not Jesus Christ, because uh, Jesus Christ is our salvation. He is the embodiment of everything. And so if the theme about Jesus Christ could dwell in our heart and be at our lips every now and then, we shall have that song that uh, is triumphant. But um, we have found joy in dwelling on other things rather than dwelling on Jesus Christ and his efficacy until we have not learned the rhythm of overcoming sin, and we have not had the efficacious merits of his blood. And so I want to explore the issue of efficacy because every time we talk about efficacy or the power that comes with the atoning sacrifice, we don't see it working in our lives, but uh, Christ has made it possible that it may work. But also in exploring this efficacy, I want to go a little bit further, maybe some things you know, maybe some things you don't know, that uh, this efficacy really do not just cover humanity, but also covers the unfallen world, it covers the inhabitants, uh, the angels, and it covers the whole universe. In fact, I'll start with with a verse in the book of Romans chapter eight. And uh, I won't be projecting the verses for the sole purpose that you may also have your Bible and you may double check as I read if the things that I'm reading are really true. Uh, the book of Romans chapter eight, talking about the efficacy and not only the efficacy covering humanity, but covering unfallen world, covering the angels and covering everything that was created. Romans chapter eight, uh, and I'll start from verse uh, 19 to 25. The word of God says, for the unexpected, Honest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. 
for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we, we see not, then we do with patience wait for it. And so in verse um, 19, we are being told that uh, for the annexed expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. When you look at the plants, when you look at the animals, when you look at the things that surround you, actually, if it were not foreseen, they could have not been the way they are. And if there was no atoning of Jesus Christ, atonement on the cross, then also these things could not be there. It is because Jesus stepped in. And we remember when man sinned, the earth was cast because of the blood of, uh, because of sin. And then when um, um, there is a uh, Cain shared the blood of Abel, again, the earth was cast. But now Christ has stepped in and uh, he is the one who is keeping things going on, meaning that his stepping in covers even the creatures, not only human beings. But not only that, but we shall see it covers a lot of things. And uh, let us look at this veil and it is efficacy. Yesterday we were looking at uh, the veil and the new living way. But uh, now let us um, dwell into this um, as much as we can. We have to remember the feasts and the sanctuary itself. It is a rehearsal of the great event, which is the event of the marriage supper of the lamb and his bride, the new Jerusalem. And in the new Jerusalem, we shall have all that have been redeemed on the face of the earth. And so the entire Jewish economy was a symbol of the process of redemption. And uh, I cover the Jewish wedding model also is a miniature, um, it is a, a miniature uh, 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 view, it is a miniature uh, uh, um, a revelation of uh, the plan of redemption. God gave live uh, active prophetic parables regarding the plan of salvation. God's foreknowledge was at work and uh, seeing that they would be seen, he really, uh, he really uh, put in place the redemption plan or uh, what we call the sanctuary service so that if man could fall in sin, then Christ could come in to redeem him. Now, this is uh, what we read. And uh, I hope that uh, all can have a view of the screen. Let me hear a yes if we are seeing my screen. Yes. Thank you so much. He made it of a small account in consideration of the result that he was working out on behalf of us, not only the inhabitants of this peck of a world, but uh, the whole universe, every world which God had created. Now, in the book of Hebrews, I'll go to the book of Hebrews chapter one very quickly. Some people say that, uh, where does E.G. White get this idea that we have other worlds? Hebrews chapter one, and uh, it is verses one. This is what we read in Hebrews chapter one and uh, verses one, it says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manner spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in this last day spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, 
by whom also he made the worlds. That is plural. So we are not only talking about this speck of a planet, this one planet called planet Earth, but we have other worlds which he made. And uh, uh, we are told that God at Sandra time, he spoke by prophets, but at this time he has spoken through his son, not only to this world that we are living in, but even to the other worlds. So you start understanding that the efficacy of the cross, the veil which we found it is by a new living way, that is to mean his flesh, does not only speak of the redemption of humanity, but it speaks of the efficacy that covers the whole universe. And that is why we read, uh, um, that is um, why we read in, uh, in uh, 5 BC, 5 BC 1127.3, In 5 BC 1127.3, we read, he made it of a small account in consideration of the result that he was working out in behalf of not only the inhabitants of this speck of a world, but the whole universe, every world which God had created. Christ speaks to it through the cross. And we find that the veil is where the blood was uh, sprinkled seven times for an atonement, and on the day of atonement, the veil was cleansed. Conspicuously, on the veil, we had the angels which were embroidered there, three angels were embroidered there, and there's a reason why they were embroidered there. We shall be covering it in the presentation number five, the ministry of angels. We shall see why the angels were on the veil. But now we are looking at the efficacy. Whom does it cover? In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 68.2, and uh, in the last three presentations, I have laid the Bible foundation, and in subsequent uh, presentations, I'll be taking from the Bible and borrowing from uh, E.G. White uh, to bring in some clear light on that. So, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 68, paragraph 2, but the plan of redemption had a yet broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. Praise the Lord. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. So the character of God needed to be vindicated in the whole universe, in the other worlds that he made, not only the salvation of man was Christ going to die, but it was to vindicate his, the character of God in the whole universe. Now, before I, I, come, I, I finish this quote, I, I'd like us to go to the book of, uh, the book of uh, Deuteronomy and see something. When we are talking about uh, vindicating the character of God in the whole universe, uh, I'd like us to travel to the book of Leviticus, uh, the book of Deuteronomy, sorry, and uh, look at chapter 19. Look at chapter 19. It is not just about human beings in this little world that Christ died, but to vindicate the character of God in the whole universe. And so the sacrifice of Jesus Christ does not only cover this world, but even the other worlds. And we shall see that not because those beings have sinned, but there's a reason for that. But let us look at this. Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin, in any sin that he sinned. At the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses, shall the matter be established. You understand in heaven that uh, Lucifer got in a warfare over Jesus Christ as the begotten son of God. And not only that, 
he was saying that the angels are holy and they do not need the law of God. And so he wanted to bring a change in the whole universe, not only in heaven, but in the whole universe. By overturning the law of God, he was going to overturn the throne, not only in heaven, but in all the worlds that God had created. And so he arose to accuse God as a sinner. And then we are told that one witness shall not arise against a matter, but two at the mouth of two or three. So if this matter could be established and a judgment be made, we needed two or three witnesses. Now we had the angels in heaven who had not fallen. They were one witness. Jesus Christ being one of the people was being accused and God being one of the people who was, who was accused or beings which were accused, they could not be part of the witness. So we only had the heavenly angels who had never fallen. But you will say we had other, other, uh, other beings in uh, other worlds. But these were other witnesses which were making two. But for God to establish matter fully, he created man, and now we have three witnesses. The unfallen angels, we have the inhabitants of, uh, and, uh, the inhabitants of other worlds, unfallen worlds, and then we have human beings on this planet who are standing as a jury where God and his son have been accused that their government is an arbitrary government, a government that forces people to do this and this. And so verse 16 of chapter 19 of Deuteronomy, if a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him, that which is wrong. So he is accusing the father and the son falsely. Then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges which shall be in those days. Now, the father and the son are accused. And we have the jury, which is the unfallen angels, the inhabitants of unfallen worlds and humanity. They have to determine the matter. Is this case so that God and his son are a bad people? And then verse 18, and the judges shall make diligent inquisition and behold, if the witness be a false witness and hath testified falsely against his brother, then shall ye do unto him as he had thought to have done unto his brother. So shall thou put the evil away from among you and those which remain, that is the remnant who shall be saved shall hear and fear and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil among you. And thine eye shall not pity, but life shall go for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, and foot for foot. And so we are seeing that um, the only way this matter could be established is for God to send his son to die. And on not only to send his son to die, but to live a life that Satan had said that uh, fallen beings could not live, and then vindicate the character of God, both in heaven and on earth. And we shall be seeing that uh, in fullness of time, he must gather all things, both which are in heaven and on earth, in which way that all the witness might be brought together and then a case be determined. And so we were in PP, Patriarchs and Prophets, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 68.2. But the plan of redemption had a yet broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. It was for this alone that Christ came. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. To this result of his great sacrifice, it is influence upon the intelligence of other worlds as well as upon man, the Savior looked forward when just before his crucifixion, he said, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. That is John chapter 12, verse 31 and 32. The act of Christ in dying for the salvation of man will not only make heaven accessible to men, but before all the universe, it will justify God and his son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. 
it will establish the perpetuity of the law of God and will reveal the nature and results of sin. Will reveal the results, will reveal the nature of the results of sin. Continued on, we are told in uh, this is uh, in First Peter chapter one verses ten. First Peter chapter one verses ten, talking about this efficacy that encompasses the angels, humanity, and the whole creation. We are told of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what, or, searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ, which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow, should follow, and to whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel Unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angel desire to look into. And um, we are going to see in Ephesians chapter 3 why the angels would like to look into the plan of redemption. In fact, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 7 to 11 says this Wherefore I was made a minister, that is Paul, according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. And to me, whom I am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, the man for wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. So Paul is saying he was made a minister and to which intent to reveal the mystery of God by the redemption plan how man is made one with God, we are told the mystery is unveiled to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. And we know that uh, in heavenly places, we have the fallen angels and the unfallen angels. And so by the salvation of man and by the death of Jesus Christ and by the church preaching the gospel, as we have read in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 12, the angels look into these things. They desire to look into these things because as man is brought into oneness with God, there is a mystery that is revealed. And not only that, we understand that um, the sonship of Christ to God or to the Father is revealed in the creation of Adam and Eve. And so these things that God was doing on earth was some revelation to the angels who are not there back in eternity to know of the things that had transpired uh, there. And uh, by the gospel, these things are being made known to the angels. In fact, we shall see it was not until after Calvary that the angels understood what was happening. They had just a miniature of what was going on, but after the cross, uh, they really understand what this was all about, and uh, uh, we shall be seeing that. Now, um, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. Uh, this is what we read. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. All things, we are talking about all things, not only things on earth, but also things in heaven and things in the unfallen worlds. We are talking about the veil, where the blood was sprinkled. That efficacy is not only for the speck, the little speck, or, 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 or this is planet, or the, the inhabitants of this world, but all things. And 
it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in heaven should be purified with this, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than this. Now, when we always read the book of Hebrews chapter 9 and um, the verse that uh, we have just read, it is verses 23, we sometimes ask ourselves, what is these things in heaven that have to be purified? Uh, we, we always know that there are things on earth that have to be purified, but what about heaven? What has to be purified there? It is to remove any lingering doubt about the character of God. That is why we are told that the efficacy is a revelation. It covers the whole universe and the, all creatures so that uh, every creature may come to a position to decide either if it is heaven or if it is being on the side of the adversary. So the things of heaven had to be cleansed with better things. The things of heaven had uh, to be cleansed with uh, better things. Now, war started in heaven. And if there is any place that uh, any doubts emanated from, it is heaven. And so every doubt must be removed. And how does it get removed? By the efficacy of the cross. And so the things in heaven must be cleansed with better things. Now, think about this. No human being could die for uh, the, the sins of Adam and Eve. Because the law was divine and it needed a divine being for it to be atoned for. That is why no human being could be able to atone for sacrifice and then no angel because the angels bear the yoke of obedience. And so it was a divine being that could atone for the divine law. And not only that, the angels are not human beings. They are divine beings. So human sacrifice could not be used to cover the plan of redemption for the angels to come to the knowledge of the character of God. So it was only a divine being by God giving his son that even he, as a divine being, could cover the angels which are divine. And that is how the efficacy could be completed. In the book of um, Psalms, allow me to give you a verse in the book of Psalms that um, no man can ransom another man. Psalms. I hope to get the verse. That is Psalms 49, verses 7. Let us. Um, See what Psalms 49 verses 7 says. Psalms 49 verse 7. You, we must understand that the sacrifice was divine and not um, human. Psalms 49 verse 7. This is what we read. Psalms 49 verse 7. None of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. Human beings cannot give a ransom for the sin problem because they do not have the quality of life that is needed for that divine law that was broken and to cover the angels. Continued on, we read uh, this. Ephesians 1.8, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. We are, we are looking at the veil, the sacrifice, the new living way. How the sacrifice covers not only the earth, but also the angels and the unfallen beings uh, and the inhabitants of uh, unfallen ones. 
that you are told that in the fullness of the dispensation of time that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, that they may come to one understanding. Ephesians 1.19, for it pleased the Father that in him should all, should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross. Now listen to that. The blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, him becoming the veil on which sin is transferred for, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, by the blood of his cross, all things on earth and all things in heaven are reconciled on the cross by his blood. So we are not just looking at a, an atonement for this world alone. We are looking at an atonement, the veil, a new living way, his flesh that really covers the things in heaven and the things on earth. Remember, the blood of the gods and the lambs could not make the commas there imperfect and could not atone for the things in heaven. For we have read in Hebrews that in heaven, it needed something better for it is cleansing. And so the blood of gods and lamb being the blood of creatures could not atone for the things in heaven, which are higher than them. You cannot take something less and use it to atone something which is a higher above it. So you cannot take the blood of the lamb and the goat to atone or to cover the angels who are of a higher nature than the goats and the lambs. And then it could not only also make the commas there in their conscience perfect, but only it meant for a shadow of good things to come. So these good things to come, it is higher than everything. And that is why it can cover uh, the atonement and the efficacy of the things in heaven and the things on earth. We continue. And uh, the book of, uh, there is um, in uh, Review and Herald, January 11, 1881, paragraph four. While we rejoice that there are worlds which have never fallen. Now, I want you to listen carefully to what uh, inspiration is saying. While we rejoice that there are worlds which have never fallen, these worlds render praise and honor and glory to Jesus Christ for the plan of redemption to save the fallen sons of Adam, as well as to confirm themselves in their position and character of purity. Praise the Lord. We are now seeing the efficacy that uh, not only for Adam and Eve in this world, that the atonement was made. But even for these beings in other worlds, the efficacy on the cross confirms them in their position and character and purity. Now, you may think that, uh, oh, Christ came just to die for this earth. No way. It was not only for this earth. Now, if the unfallen world and the unfallen angels really are kept and look for, looked forward for the cross and they are confirmed in it, how much more about us who have fallen? Sometimes we joke so much around with the efficacy on the cross and uh, we really don't um, value the sacrifice that God gave unto us. But the angels who have never fallen and the inhabitants of unfallen world, they are confirmed in their purity and character by the cross, the blood that was shed on the cross. It says the arm that raised the human family from the ruin, which Satan had brought upon the race through the temptation, is the arm which has preserved the inhabitants of other worlds from sin. So this death of Jesus Christ has done what it has uh, preserved. It is only the cross that preserves 
the inhabitants of other worlds from sin, nothing else. If it was not for the cross, then we don't know what we'll be saying today about the unfallen worlds and uh, the angels who had never seen. Every world throughout immensity engages the care and support of the Father and the Son, and this care is constantly exercised for fallen human, humanity. Now, check the words in yellow. Christ is mediating in behalf of man, and the order of unseen worlds also is preserved by his mediatorial work. So the mediation covers man and also in, it, it, it uh, covers uh, the order of unseen world. If Christ could have not entered into mediation, then the order of unseen world definitely could have not been preserved. Are not these themes of sufficient magnitude and importance to engage our thoughts and call forth our gratitude and adoration to God? That is a question to ask. To the angels and the unfallen worlds, the cry, it is finished, had a deep significance. It was for them as well as for us that the great work of redemption had been accomplished. Brothers and sisters, we need to think about the things we are reading. That the words, it is finished. It was for them as well as for us that the great work of redemption had been accomplished. They with us share the fruits of Christ's victory. Without Christ having victory, then the unfallen ones could not have anything to be victorious about. Continued on, I know things that we are reading, maybe they can be new and peculiar things. 5 BC 1132.8. The death of Christ upon the cross made sure the destruction of him who has the power of death, who was the originator of sin. When Satan is destroyed, there will be none to tempt to evil. The atonement will never need to be repeated, and there will be no danger of another rebellion in the universe of God. That which alone can effectually restrain from sin in this world of darkness will prevent sin in heaven. The significance of the death of Christ will be seen by saints and angels. Fallen men could not have a home in the paradise of God without the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Shall we not then exalt the cross of Christ? The angels ascribe honor and glory to Christ, for even they are not secure except by looking to the sufferings of the Son of God. It is through the efficacy of the cross that the angels of heaven are guarded from apostasy. I, I don't know what to say about this. Without the cross, they would be no more secure against evil than were the angels before the fall of Satan. Angelic perfection failed in heaven. Human perfection failed in Eden. The paradise of bliss. All who wish for security in earth or heaven must look to the Lamb of God. Both the angels and both human beings and the inhabitants of unfallen world, if they will be secure they can only be secure in looking to the Lamb of God. Now, when it says the Lamb, it doesn't mean Christ when he was in heaven. It means Christ when he was on earth because there were no lambs in heaven. It is only lambs that were, it, it's only on earth that we had lambs. So it is by Christ coming here that these angels can be able to be benefited. Bible Training School, December 1, 1907, paragraph 4. Not only man, but angels will ascribe honor and glory to the Redeemer, for even they are secure only through the sufferings of the Son of God. It is through the efficacy of the cross that the inhabitants of unfallen worlds have been guided from apostasy. It is this that has effectually unveiled the deceptions of Satan and refuted his claims. Not only those that are washed by the blood of Christ, but also the holy angels are drawn to him by his crowning act of giving his life for the sin of the world. Not only for men, but angels, not only men, but angels will ascribe honor and glory to the Redeemer, for even they are secure only through the sufferings of the Son of God. And it continues to be repeated and to be repeated. I said when I was beginning that um, there are things that angels do not understand and they desire to look into this plan of redemption. 
and all they still had sympathies with Satan before Christ died. But when they saw Christ hanging on Calvary, we read this, the last sympathies were uprooted. And so that is why we are being told that even they, they have been kept from apostates by looking at the cross. So before the cross, they had sympathies for Satan. But after that, look at this. Satan saw that his disguise was torn away. His administration was laid open before the fallen angels and before the heavenly universe. He had revealed himself a murderer. By shedding the blood of the Son of God, he had uprooted himself from the sympathies of the heavenly beings. So before that, they still had sympathy. Continued reading on, henceforth his work was restricted. Restricted to what? We read in the book of Job, chapter 1, that um, when the inhabitants of the unfallen world came to gather before God, Satan also presented him there. Why? He had usurped this world from Adam. And Adam had lost his kingship over the earth, and Satan had usurped it. And so he could rightly go there to represent earth. Until Christ came to die on the cross, and became the rightful owner of this earth, it was still in the hands of the prince of the air. But now when he died a victorious person, it means that Adam had been redeemed from his fall, and now Christ uh, was holding the kingdom for him because now he is the one who is the kinsman redeemer. The kinsman redeemer was able to take the property that the stranger had taken from the owner. So we found that the stranger in Leviticus chapter 25 was Satan, and he had taken something from Adam. When the kinsman redeemer came, then he took back from the stranger, that is Satan, that which he had taken from Adam. And so um, we find that uh, um, at the cross, these angels had still sympathy. But after the cross, all these sympathies were uprooted by, uh, uh, by uh, the, these sympathies were uprooted from their heart. Whatever attitude he might assume, he could no longer await the angels as they came from the heavenly courts. So in the book of Job, you find him appearing, you find him appearing uh, in the gates of heaven to be the representative of this earth. But when Jesus Christ died, he was restricted. We are told he was restricted. Restricted from where? From going out of this planet. So Satan has only access of this planet. He doesn't have access to the other parts of this universe or other worlds. He is restricted. His work was restricted. And so I was saying whatever attitude he might assume, he could no longer await the angels as they came from the heavenly courts. And before them accused Christ's brethren of being clothed with the garments of blackness and the defilement of sin. The last link of sympathy between Satan and the heavenly world was broken. There was still sympathy. They could take a report to the heavenly father about what Satan wanted. But now when Christ died on Calvary, when he murdered, Satan murdered Jesus Christ. He shed the blood of the innocent son of God. The last link of sympathy between Satan and the heavenly world was broken. Now, if you're having sympathy with a sinner, you may not be a sinner, but you may just end up one day being a sinner. So the heavenly angels have never fallen, but they still had sympathy with Satan. And this sympathy could have drawn them in one way or another to Satan. But the cross, the efficacy, the veil, the flesh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 20, by new living way, the veil, that is to say his flesh. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, we are told that uh, sin was put on him who knew sin for the sake of our righteousness. And we have been told the angels are confirmed in their position and character, and they are kept from apostasy by the crowning act of the death of Jesus Christ. And so their character remains unspotted because of one this thing, 
the crucifixion. So the last sympathy is broken. We read on angels and the plan of redemption, and this we shall cover fully in presentation number five, but I'm just uh, 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 if dropping of what we are going to learn. Why, why are the angels to participate in this, um, uh, in this efficacy? Because, listen, we, when we are saved, we become ambassadors, we become messengers, we become channels of the salvation we have received. Because angels have been covered from apostasy or uh, 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 have been um, shielded from apostasy, they also must bear the messages to those who are being saved. They become messengers in turn. You can read that in uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 7, and Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. Are they not messengers? Are they not ministers of the Spirit? Ministering spirits, I mean. So, angels and the plan of redemption, a measure of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Through the ministry of the angels, the Holy Spirit is enabled to work upon the mind and heart of human agent and draw him to Christ, who has paid the ransom money for his soul, that the sinner may be rescued from the slavery of sin and Satan. Youth Instructor, July 5, 1894, paragraph 5. So as they are shielded from apostasy, the only thing that can confirm them in their position and character is to minister the same thing that they have been kept from. And so these holy beings participate in the plan of redemption. Remember what uh, Angel Gabriel tells John in the book of Revelation, I'm a fellow, I am a fellow servant of thy brethren, the prophets. Angels are prophets, by the way. They have the gift of prophecy. Angels have the gift of healing. Angels have all these gifts that you see in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and angels have the fruit of the spirit. And because they have these things, they minister unto those who are becoming heirs of salvation. The, this is uh, Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 337, paragraph 2. The angel messengers will expel sin from the heart. In which way? By carrying the messages from heaven and bringing it on earth to human beings. When men want to sin, we are told they'll hear a little voice saying, this is the way, follow it. That should be, um, you shall hear, hear a voice behind you. That is Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21. Let us uh, read what it says. Isaiah chapter, Isaiah chapter 50, verses Isaiah verses 30, verse, uh, verses 30, chapter 30, verses 21, sorry. Isaiah 30, 21. Isaiah chapter 30, verses 21. This is what we read. And thine ears shall hear a word behind this saying, this is the way walk ye in it when you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left. And so we are told that these heavenly messengers will uh, expel sin from the heart. Testimonies to ministers and gospel workers, page 337, paragraph 2. The angel ministers will expel sin from the heart by bringing the glad tidings to those who are being tempted. Unless the door of heart is padlocked and Christ is refused admission, Christ will withdraw himself from those who persist in refusing the heavenly blessings that are so freely offered them. 2SP 37.1. These heavenly messengers are not attracted to the crowd where minds are diverted from heavenly things. These pure and holy spirits cannot remain in the company where Jesus' presence is not desired and encouraged and his absence not marked. We are looking at the efficacy. Um, the father is a comforter. The son is a comforter. And also we are told that the angels are comforters. Early writings 39.1, I have seen the tender love that God has for his people and it's very great. I saw that angels 
I saw angels over the saints with their wings spread about them. Each saint had an attending angel. If the saints swept through discouragement or were in danger, the angels that ever attended them will fly quickly upward to carry the tidings and the angels in the city will cease to sing. Then Jesus will commission another angel to descend to encourage, watch over and try to keep them from going out of the narrow path. But if they do not take heed to the watchful care of these angels and will not be comforted by them, but continue to go astray, the angels will look sad and weep. So the angels are comforters. Don't think that when you are mourning, when you are struggling with sin, you do not have a comforter besides you. We have the omnipresent spirit of Christ as the comforter to the soul, and we have the angels also as the comforter that we are given. That is our writing page 39.1. The importance of the study of about the angels, and why are we studying about this efficacy, how it covers the angels, and how are they involved in the plan of redemption? In uh, Manuscript 36, 1889, paragraph 11, God's word has not left angelic ministration in obscurity or unimportant. Let us consider this matter attentively, for there are many who, if they consider this matter as it is, that heavenly messengers are by their side to guide them, to shield them from evil, to admonish them from yielding to temptation, will not commit sin so readily. So if we realize that the heavenly angels are amongst us, it will not be easier for us to sin. Satan is not only obscuring that God has a son, but also that go good angels are about us. That is manuscript 36, 1889, paragraph 13. Satan would put these things out of our minds. For in proportion as we lose sight of these things and that good angels are around about us, ministering spirits, we will forget that our great adversary, the devil, with his evil angels, is continually labor laboring to effect our destruction. These angels who have been kept from apostasy knows better how to keep us from apostasy. They were there with Lucifer in heaven as a holy angel. He became Satan while still in heaven. And uh, then they saw his rebellion. They understand his tricks. And so we human beings who are not older than angels, we need angels to be around us so that they may be able to shield us from the tricks of Satan himself. They have been kept from apostasy by the cross, and they have knowledge how to keep us from apostasy. Angels are agencies to strengthen the weak from sinning. And we are talking about the veil, which is a new living way, and it is an efficacy. And you are seeing how the angels are playing part in the plan of keeping man from sinning. The subject of angelic ministration has not had the attention it deserves. Ministers of Christ need to keep these matters before their congregations to strengthen the weak and to lead the strong to feel that it is dangerous to depend upon their own strength. For, for says Christ, without me, you can do nothing. We must always rely on Christ and the agencies he has provided for our salvation, else we will be lost. You cannot say that you need Christ, and then you say you don't need his messengers. So in the plan of redemption, angels participate in it according to 1 Peter, um, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 12, that they desire to look into these things. And as they participate in these things, Paul says that the mystery of God is even unveiled to them. That which they don't understand is unveiled to them. One is same. Uh, the cost of our redemption, 1SM 256.1. In taking upon himself man's nature in its fallen condition, Christ did not in the least participate in its sin. He was subject to the infirmities and weaknesses by which man is encompassed, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses, Matthew 8.17. He was touched with the feeling of our infirmities and was in all points tempted like as we are, and yet he knew no sin. He was the lamb without blemish and without spot, 1 Peter 1 19. Could Satan in the least particular have tempted Christ to sin, he would have bruised the Savior's head. As it was, he could only touch his heel. Had the head of Christ been touched, the hope of human race would have perished. Divine wrath 
would have come upon Christ as it came upon Adam. Christ and the church would have been without hope. Now, people say that Christ would have not been lost, but these things are similar. If you look at um, the book of Hebrews chapter 5, let us go to Hebrews chapter 5. We don't understand the cost of that veil. We don't understand the cost of the efficacy of Christ and what it entails. Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, and I'm rushing there. Hebrews chapter 5, and I'm reading from verse 7 to verse 10. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death. Which is this death that Christ is saying that he was to be saved from? It is not the death that he died on the cross. It is the death of eternally being lost. He cried. He supplicated that he may not sin. He may be preserved and he may not die because the death at the cross he died. He was not saved from it. The death that he was saved from is the eternal loss of his identity forever. And so we are told that he risked, if he had been bruised his head, then the wrath of God could have fallen on him as it fell on Adam. Adam was chased from Eden. That is the wrath of God. If Christ could have sinned, then also he could have been chased from Eden, which is heavenly Eden. He could have never seen that place again. And so he was saved from the death and was hard in that he feared. What did Christ fear? He never feared this cross that we say uh, he died on the cross for atonement. No. He feared the eternal separation from the father. Though he were a son, yet learned obedient by the things which he suffered and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, called of God and a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, if Christ could have not been made perfect or overcome sin, now I will not be here speaking to you neither would you be there listening to me. We are told that the wrath of God could have fallen on him and Christ and the church will have had no hope. Now, if you have no hope, what do you have? Only loss. That is all that uh, you have. We, we, we must come to a point that we shall start con uh, appreciating what the sacrifice of Christ is. That is 1SM 256.1. Signs of the Time, May 10, 1899, paragraph 11. Signs of the Time, May 10, 1899, paragraph 11, we, are, we read. But although Christ's divine glory was for a time veiled and eclipsed by his assuming humanity, yet he did not cease to be God when he became man. The human did not take the place of the divine or the divine of the human. This is the mystery of godliness. The two expression human and divine were in Christ closely and inseparably one, and yet they had a distinct individuality. Though Christ humbled himself to become man, the Godhead was still his own. His deity could not be lost while he stood faithful and true to his loyalty. Now, if it cannot be lost because of loyalty, then disloyal, disloyal means that it can be lost. This is the kind of uh, risk that was taken for the efficacy of humanity, the angels, and the inhabitants of an fallen world. We read on that um, in Science of the Time, May 10, 1899, we read, for a period of time, Christ was on probation. He took humanity on himself to stand the test and trial which the first Adam failed to endure. Had he failed in his test and trial, he would have been disobedient to the voice of God and the world would have been lost. Now, where was Christ? Christ was in the world. He was not in heaven while he was on earth. He was restricted to this earth because he was a human being. So the world would have been lost. It means everything in the world. And Christ being in the world, being disloyal and his date being lost, he would have been lost with the world. This is the power of the efficacy. In 16 MR 182.3, 
the divine nature combined with the human nature, human made him capable of yielding to Satan's temptation. Here, the test to Christ was far greater than that of Adam and Eve. Think about being able to come in possession with the power that can prevent you from uh, 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 dying, but you decide that you will go all the way. You lay down your life so that uh, you may save another person. That is the atonement we are talking about. And by doing this, the last link of sympathy he had, the, 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 unfallen, the unfallen angels had with Satan, they were removed. When Christ died on, on Calvary, they saw that this was murder and nothing else. Christ object lesson, page 196, paragraph four, as we enter into the last segment. The value of a soul, who can estimate? Will you know it is worth? Go to Gethsemane and there watch with Christ through those hours of anguish when he sweat as it were great drops of blood. Look upon the Savior uplifted on the cross. Hear that despairing cry, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Mark 15, 34. Look upon the wounded head, the pierced side and mud feet. Remember that Christ risked all. For our redemption, heaven itself was imperiled. Think for that, that for a minute. That if Christ could have failed, you know what was the accusation of Satan? Man cannot keep the law of God. Angels do not need the law of God because it does their holy. If Christ came here and he was lost, then we are told it is the cross that keeps the unfallen angels from apostasy. Now, if there were not that cross, the character of God could have not been vindicated in the unfallen world and in the heaven. This world will have been lost. And we are told because of the cross, there will be no other rebellion. So if the cross was not there, then we are trying to start thinking of another rebellion because that which God claimed can be done could not be done. And so how will the angels trust God who have said this is possible and then it is impossible? We are told by Christ coming on this earth, heaven itself was imperiled. For if he had failed and the angels were waiting to see if God is true, then God could have proved to be a liar and there could have been another rebellion. That is what I can really deduct from what I'm reading so far. Now, Science of the Time, April 14, 1898, paragraph six. Satanic agencies confederated with evil men to lead the people to believe that Christ was the chief of sinners and to make him an object of detestation. But the priests and rulers failed to realize that in Christ, divinity was enthroned in humanity. Christ's humanity could not be separated from his divinity. Could one sin have been found in Christ, the world would have plunged into blackness and ruin. We think about this over and over again and think about the purchase of humanity. Our kinsman redeemer risking all to come and die for us. These are things that uh, should cause us to recoil when we come into conduct with sin. When the angels look into these things, they are kept from apostasy. How about us? How comes that we delight to sin when the very things that keeps the angels from sinning have been revealed unto us? If these things can keep the angels from sinning, why should they not keep us from sinning? If this is how great the efficacy is, why don't we contemplate upon it each day and we rejoice in seeing sin, participating in sin, and just continue saying God knows about this thing. He knows that I'm trying. He knows about this thing. The angels cannot say God understands. Let us try to fall into apostasy a little bit. 
they are kept from apostasy by this cross. Why is it that we cannot see these things as the angels see them? Forgive me if I, I, uh, I sound so harsh on us. Manuscript 43, 1895. Christ has found his pearl of great price in lost perishing souls. He sold all that he had to come into possession of that pearl. He even engaged to do the work himself and to run the risk of losing his own life in the conflict. How can people say that Christ could have not been lost, brothers and sisters? How could they say that he was just playing here on earth and if something could have failed, he could have gone back in heaven while humanity could be lost? We, we, we don't understand the things the way they, they are. Angels never understood these things, but when he died on the cross, they came to understand them. We as a people who are directly being saved from sin, we should understand these things better. Christ could have lost his own life in the conflict. But now that he won, no rebellion will be there, no apostates among the angels, and no human being who will be saved in heaven will be lost. He became subject to temptation, endangering as he to his divine attributes. Letter 5, 1900. As we read the last three slides. One alone who alone was sufficient and fully able to accomplish this mission, Christ, who was one with the Father, laid off his royal robe and his royal crown, clothed his divinity with humanity, and came into the world to bless the world with a living personation of God. He could approach the human family only as he should hide his glory and employ the faculties of human being. Then humanity could touch humanity, while his veiled divinity recognized in heaven could lay hold of the infinite one. The father and the son saw that it was expedient that Christ, the only begotten of the father, should make himself visible and walk and talk with men, not as an angel, but as a teacher sent from God, possessing all the attributes of the Godhead under the garb of humanity, revealing the love, the sympathy, the compassion of God, all that encompassed him. Talking about possessing all the attributes of the Godhead, all this could have been lost if Christ had sinned. There's nothing else Christ could have gotten back. He came here and he could have lost everything, his previous life and his present life on earth. All of it could have been lost. And when the angels look at these things, they marvel. In a body which God and not man had prepared, he was fully able to unveil and disclose to man the perfection of Jehovah and reveal his paternal character as God of infinite love. Uh, continued on. We read this. Uh, Jesus did not count heaven a place to be desired while we were lost. He left heavenly courts for a life of reproach and insult and death of shame. He who was rich in heaven's priceless treasure became poor that through his poverty we might be rich. We are to follow in his path he trod. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Christ knew that if he sinned, his separation with the Father will be eternal. Desire of Ages 131.2. Never can the cost of our redemption be realized until the redeemed shall stand with the Redeemer before the throne of God. Then as the glories of the eternal home burst upon our enraptured senses, we shall remember that Jesus left all for this for us, that he not only became an exile from the heavenly coast, but for, our, for us took the risk of failure and eternal loss. Lastly, General Conference Bulletin, December 1, 1895, paragraph 22. Who can estimate the value of a soul? Go to the Gethsemane and there watch with Jesus through the long hours of anguish when he sweat as it were drops of blood. Look upon the Savior uplifted on the cross, hear the despairing cry, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Look upon the wounded head, 
the pierced side, the mud feet. Remember that Christ risked all. Tempted like as we are, he staked even his own eternal existence upon the issue of the conflict. Heaven itself was imperiled for our redemption. At the foot of cross, remembering that for one sinner, Jesus would have yielded up his life, we may estimate the value of a soul. My prayer is that we may start viewing these things as the angels use them. And if this efficacy can keep them from falling, then we can be sure that uh, it can keep us also from falling. My prayer is that uh, the Lord may be able to bring a new zeal in us for perfection. And as the angels and heavenly intelligences are working for our salvation, let us avail ourselves for it. Let us remember that um, everything is at stake, as we can say, but because it was at stake, but because Christ has died on Calvary, his victory is our victory, just as his victory is the victory of the angels. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you because there will be no other rebellion, neither from the angels nor from the saved because of the efficacy on the cross, the veil, the flesh of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that we may continue beholding the glory of Christ and be changed into the self-same glory. And thank you for these things and thank you for accepting us in thy son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.